judiciary prosecuting the law. An estimated 1,546 lawyers have been subjected to prosecution in Turkey, and this panel aims to understand how far international law can intervene in individual cases to ensure that due process is carried out and produce outcomes that keep the legal profession in Turkey free and independent. I'd like to introduce my panel, Natasha Brack, Professor Dr. Hussein Demir, and Dr. Salah Under. Natasha Brack is a program lawyer registered with the Paris Bar, who manages the International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute work in the MENA region and in Turkey. Over the past four years, she has worked for various international tribunals, including the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, and the International Criminal Court. I'd like to welcome Professor Dr. Hussein Demir. He is a professor of human rights and constitutional law. He currently lives as a political refugee in Germany, and under the state of emergency in 2016, he lost his job and was forced to flee, unable to see his family for over two years. His young son was also wrongfully arrested and placed in custody while the state tried to locate him. Dr. Salah Under is a Turkish lawyer and author currently residing in Switzerland. Whilst he was living in his homeland, Dr. Under worked as a lawyer. He was a member of the Ankara Bar Association and after the failed coup in 2016, he and his wife, who was a judge, were both dismissed from their jobs and prosecuted by the authorities. He is now living in Switzerland. Welcome, thank you for being with us. Professor Demir, if I could come to you first. We know that 1,546 lawyers are, have said to have been prosecuted since July 2016. What is the motive of the Turkish government for prosecuting its own judiciary? What could possibly be behind this? First of all, thank you for inviting us here. Actually, my numbers are quite a bit different. Uh, we have over 4,000 judges and prosecutors dismissed and more than 2,000 judges and prosecutors are in, the, in prison now. And also the, uh, lawyers, more than 700 are in prison. So this is a disaster actually for law. Uh, law. Uh, the problem here is uh, the Erdogan government doesn't like law. And certainly they don't like the principle uh, of uh, rule of law. And then uh, they try to establish a judiciary which completely obey Erdogan, and not to law, not to international uh, or universal uh, rights or legal documents. So that's why they choose to put these people in prison or dismiss them from the public services. And it's interesting enough to see that just a few hours after the coup attempt, uh, more than 2,000 judges and prosecutors were uh, dismissed and uh, been arrested. So that shows us how they were prepared to do this before even the coup. So th when they based uh, their allegations on saying that these judges or these lawyers were involved in uh, coup attempt, which is completely wrong, but uh, one should think that how can they know it before the coup attempt? So there is no law in Turkey, unfortunately. Before I come here, I was thinking what to sp uh, talk about, but I thought that it's best to tell my own story first because people may not be interested in uh, numbers, but there is people here in front of audience or other uh, people alive, um, suffered from the purge in Turkey, for example, myself, because I was working for public sector as a lecturer and also in a min some, one of the ministry. I worked for more than 24 years. Then one day, one day I realized that I was dismissed and I had no choice but to flee from Turkey. And I had to leave my family behind because I had to leave with a false ID card because uh, they canceled our passports 
and they didn't let us to leave the country. But I am only one of uh, 100, maybe more than 7,000 pe people who were dismissed from the public service, and they have no chance to find any job in anywhere. Because when you go and apply for a job, they see your uh, social security details saying that I've been dismissed. So they say, sorry, we can't give you a job. Otherwise, we'll be in trouble. So they expect us. They expect us to die out of hunger if they don't put us in jail. Those that haven't been dismissed, you were a lawyer, your wife was a judge, you were dismissed. No, and I am a Professor Demir. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, so what hope is there for people that are trying to carry out their job in the legal profession in Turkey? Is there any chance that they can carry out their job? And what are the challenges and dangers that they would face just doing their job? Well, I think uh, this question should be answered by my friend here because he was practicing law. But, uh, but uh, I know that I can find a lawyer to present, uh, represent me. Uh, even my wife went to the police station, even though my brother is a lawyer there, but he's afraid to accompany my wife to go to police station. So that's the climate in Turkey. Mm -hmm. Because lawyers are afraid of being arrested if they defend us or if they go and represent us. So there is a big pressure on lawyers and even judges now. May, I don't think all the judges now on the bench are pro Erdoganist. Some of them, I am sure that they want to uphold the law, but they are afraid because we witnessed that a judge has been arrested while he was on the bench and he was going to give a, a judgment and they didn't like it. So they came and arrested him while he was sitting on the bench. So think about it. How can a lawyer, whether he's a judge or he's a defending uh, attorney, defense attorney, can feel secure or safe to uh, represent law or pursue that uh, the government or the go administrative authorities is in line with law. Dr. Under, if I could come to you now, the um, ongoing state of emergency, which contradicts international law, has allowed the Turkish government to harass, detain, and imprison members of the judicial system. What can the international community do to put pressure on Turkey to try and stop this? Actually, uh, uh, actually, uh, failed coup attempt was the uh, a simple theater because uh, ju only just some uh, soldier uh, joined it, but uh, government uh, used it uh, for beneficial and uh, declared the lots of lawyer as a terrorist because uh, they want to hang, hang to law, uh, I mean interrupt the law, because um, they see law is the big uh, block of to them. Uh, so they decided to uh, dismiss uh, thousands of the lawyers uh, from their job and uh, they start to arrest the lawyers after f five days uh, cop attempt. And uh, actually, uh, I also was uh, referring to some of my uh, witness, uh, like uh, Professor Demir. Uh, after failed cop attempt, uh, the police uh, uh, twice uh, came to my house just for search to uh, some special books uh, and they uh, arrest me uh, and uh, it's really ex uh, difficult to explain but uh, I stand up to one judge, he was so young and he said to me, uh, my friend, 
you know the, the, what is the condition after COP attempt. Uh, and I am waiting, I expecting to understand me. Uh, it is really difficult condition for me. If you, if I don't send you to jail, I will go to the jail. So please understand me. I said to him, you are judge of the state, not judge of the government or any other political party. Uh, be neutral. But he said that, please understand me. I understand you when uh, I presented uh, because there was uh, there were actually lots of judge and prosecutor in the uh, same prison. Uh, reason of to reject the uh, arrest or uh, prison to another person who is actually innocent. I charge it of. Uh, on um, as a member of the unarmed uh, terrorist organization, um, but in my life I I never have a, any kind of gun. Actually, I I was a lawyer and uh, my uh, job was the writing a letter. And um, uh, during the, my life, I always showed my sacrifice. Uh, to defend the beneficial beneficial of the state, but one day, uh, as I my uh, Mr. Demir stated, one day, uh, interestingly, uh, not state government declared to me and uh, another lawyer as a terrorist, and. Uh, I am sorry, I, I am talking a little bit more, but I have a lot of things because I am a not just speaker in here. I am a victim of to this uh, genocide and I am a witness of the live, live witness, because I have seen lots of things, lots of unlawful acts against me. Uh, Court actually prosecute charge on me uh, some uh, claims. One member of the as a member of the one lawyer association, civil association. Uh, second, uh, have a account in the bank name of Bank Asia, and another one. Uh, dismiss it by decree of law. Can you imagine? It was so funny, but it was real uh, because I was a prison near about 10 months. And after my uh, judgment, court gave me penalty another six years and 10 months. It is really <laughs> funny. I mean, dilemma. I, I'm, how can I explain? May I uh, interfere with the, in, uh, sorry, about the international pressure or what can be done to help people, victims actually in Turkey? It doesn't matter if they are lawyer or academics, or academics journalist. or journalist or even housewife or pregnant women or mothers with uh, babies in prison. Well, I studied. Uh, my PhD thesis about uh, the European Court of Human Rights. But I have to say here that I am very disappointed with the European Court of Human Rights because I was expecting the European Court of Human Rights to uh, decide that there is no domestic remedies in Turkey. But then they just played politics. Sorry to be blunt, but that's how I feel. Because we were thinking that, OK, administrative courts, they can't do anything because they are under uh, government control. Constitutional court, two of member, uh, constitutional court members were arrested, so they are afraid. But European Court of, uh, uh, of Human Rights, that was unexpected shock for me. And they just leveled with the Turkish government, and they decided to establish so-called uh, uh, what do you call it, you know, emergency rule inquiry commission, which is just a play to postpone our application to European court. I 
applied to administrative court. I applied to constitutional court. I applied to Strasbourg, European Court of Human Rights. But then I've been all rejected. Then they addressed me to the commission. And I applied to the commission. They reject my cases. Obviously, they uh, so far, they just uh, decided uh, 36,000 uh, 30, cases. And only 6% of the applications were accepted. Others were rejected. And there is still more than 80,000 cases in front of them. So when I will get my justice after 10 years, or maybe my grandchildren will get the compensation from the court. But this is really annoying. So all domestic remedies have to be exhausted first, don't they? And as a result, this backlog is going to take, I think I read in an interview that you did, and you said around 25 years. Yeah, of course. I mean, according to my calculation, well, OK, this commission uh, will, uh, this commission will work for two years. But what they do, the important thing is here, they should individually examine, analyze every case, but they don't do it. What they do, they just copy and paste. So this is not the way, the remedy, uh, Geneva Commission or European Court of uh, Human Rights uh, asked for it. But uh, two years then, then the administrative courts, there is only one administrative court for more than 100,000 cases in Ankara. They, we are expecting them to decide, then uh, appeal, then the Constitutional Court, which takes more than 10 years, maybe 15 years, then Strasbourg, another five years. So probably they'll put uh, the verdict on my uh, tomb, saying that, yeah, Tom, saying that okay, uh, he was innocent. <laughs> Natasha, if I could come to you, please. Your work at the International Bar Association has challenged Turkey by issuing a joint submission to the UN Special Rapporteur on the independence of judges and okay. lawyers in no, Turkey. No, I, oh, sorry. Chris, I, I cut your microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay. OK, I'll just do that one again. Um, Natasha, your work at the International Bar Association has challenged Turkey by issuing a joint submission to the UN Special Rapporteur on the independence of judges and lawyers in Turkey. How have your efforts been received by the UN, the international community, and have you had any response from the Turkish government? Thank you very much, uh, Trish, and thank you also uh, for everyone to, to come. I'm, I'm really happy to see uh, that the event is well attended, and I'm. I'm, I'm really happy to, to be here today. Uh, so indeed, uh, uh, last uh, two months ago, we sent a, a joint submission with the Law Society of England and Wales and the Bar Human Rights Committee of England and Wales to the Special Rapporteur on Independence of Judges and Lawyers. The submission was also uh, prepared in collaboration with six uh, other Turkish lawyers, both uh, still in Turkey, uh, lawyers in Turkey, and others living in exile uh, uh, all over Europe. Um, the, the submission itself has been very well received. I mean, as you can say, as you can see, the submission was sent to the Special Rapporteur on Independence of Judges and Lawyers. We have received a, a lot of support from, from, uh, from the Special Rapporteur, and we have met with him uh, uh, before sending him the, the Special Rapporteur. He has met the Turkish lawyers, and he has also done uh, a, a lot of advocacy regarding Turkey. And uh, it is the least to say that he is really uh, worried and concerned about the situation uh, regarding the independence of the legal profession and the judiciary in, in Turkey. Regarding states, uh, we have met also with various state missions while in Geneva. And I can say that most of the European states and even other states such as Canada and other, uh, other states are following the situation. Everyone is monitoring and really concerned about the, si the, the, uh, the current uh, attacks and breakdown on the rule of law in, uh, in the country. However, as you, we all know, our, our concerns are also uh, obstacles to concern are, for, of course, political uh, considerations. And the Syria crisis, the migrant and refugee crisis has uh, prevented European states, the EU and other, other states to uh, uh, take a strong stand against, uh, against Turkey and do further, uh, um, take further actions. We have heard that the EU, of course, we have the Venice Commission, the European Parliament have issued, uh, have published various documents uh, 
uh, resolutions, declarations, and so on, on the situation of Turkey, but it is very difficult to see a concrete result. I, I would like maybe to, 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 to be the devil's advocate regarding uh, the European Court of Human Rights, and I understand that for Turkish citizens, it is very frustrating that the European Court of Human Rights has shut down, basically, and blocked uh, most of the applications coming from Turkey. But it is also important to put everything in perspective. In 2017 only, the European Court has received 90,000 cases in Turkey. Although it shows that there are a really big problem happening in Turkey, and there is potentially, and I mean, ha surely happening a widespread and systematic attacks against uh, uh, civilians in, in Turkey. It is very difficult for the European Court of Human Rights to deal with that many cases. And I, I would say that Although, uh, in, in the cases, the, 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 the court has sent back the cases to the domestic uh, uh, jurisdiction, so the commission, as, as was mentioned earlier, the state of emergency commission or the constitutional courts, depending on the jurisdiction of the court, it is also essential that in certain cases, as lawyers, representative of victims, when you send application to, and I'm talking to Turkish uh, uh, victims and, and lawyers, when you send application to the European Court of Human Rights, that they are drafted in a way that complies with uh, European standards. And I think that this is what I've heard, that a lot of applications are not admissible just because of the, the quality of the, the, the application. So I think it's also a duty of uh, Turkish lawyers and international lawyers such as ourselves to, uh, to send the best cases and address the European Court of Human Rights in a strategic manner. So maybe not sending 90,000 cases, but sending one, the perfect case that would then trigger the jurisdiction of the court. And the court will have, uh, undoubtedly, uh, to admit, uh, to deem the, 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 the case admissible. So it's also a matter of strategy and maybe reshaping the strategy uh, regarding cases in, in Turkey. Natasha, if I could just stay with you for a moment. We know, and we've just heard the numbers and they're horrific, we know that there are many people <laughs> imprisoned and they don't get due process. What can we, the international community, do to put pressure on Turkey to honour its commitment to international law, and at the very least, to instate due process? I, I, so I, I, I think the first step, uh, uh, and I will go back to the European Court of Human Rights, just as one example, a small example, we've, see, we've seen it in the case of uh, Alpan and Altai, the journalist Alpan and Altai. The European Court of Human Rights decision has triggered uh, uh, a response from the Turkish gov government and the courts in a very uh, uh, clumsy manner, if I can say so, because as you as you know, the, the constitutional courts first order the release of the journalist, and then the lower courts refuse to uh, abide by uh, to respect the constitutional court decision. It was then sent back to the constitutional court, and then finally the, the journalists were released. And this was all done because the international community was watching because of the European Court of Human Rights decision and uh, case. So we can see also that the European Court of Human Rights, in certain cases, can, uh, can work in favor on uh, releasing uh, victims of uh, human rights violations. In addition, if I leave the European uh, framework and I move to the UN, so we're here in Geneva today, and there is a lot of advocacy which can be done uh, regarding Turkey. And I know that many of you have already been conducting advocacy at the UN level. The International Bar Association's Human Rights Institute has also been uh, training and building the capacity of Turkish lawyers on how to engage with UN human rights mechanisms. We were in, in Geneva uh, last June. They, the lawyers met with several special procedures, state missions, and so on, and now we're continuing the advocacy at another level, meaning engaging actively with uh, uh, UN human rights mechanisms. So this means, for example, sending individual complaints to treaty bodies such as the Committee Against Torture, the CAT, or to special procedures, sending information uh, to special procedures, individual complaints to special procedures, such as the working group on enforced disappearance, because enforced disappearance is a big issue in Turkey, or on arbitrary detention. So there, there are many, many avenues that can be used. And the last one I would like to, the, to, to quote is the uh, UPR, the Universal Periodic Review, which is happening very soon in Turkey. Um, I think the deadline for civil society organization, and I'm sorry, I think it's June 2019, I may be wrong, it's in tw next year. So it's also, it could be also an opportunity for civil society organizations to engage at the level of the UPR and send joint submission, as I say, it's always better to work 
in combination with other organizations in a strategic manner, because you will be stronger in number, and, and then send uh, the submission to the UPR, which will then potentially lead to recommendations by states regarding the, uh, the, the situation in Turkey. So it could be on the independence of the judiciary, the legal profession for, for, for the mandate of the International Bar Association, but also on journalists and any, any other matters. Yes, please do, yes. Robert James Parsons, independent journalist based in Geneva. Do you have any statistics on the number of cases that went through the European Court of Human Rights that were then actually enforced by the Turkish government and the number of cases that the government simply seems to ignore? And another point, what seems to be generally within the administration, the bureaucracy that handles these things, the attitude towards the European court? And in Switzerland, for example, the biggest party in the parliament is the Democratic Union of the Center, which is really the neo-Nazi party. And they have an initiative up now, it's going to be voted on the 25th, that will say that Switzerland doesn't have to abide by the rulings of the international, the, the European uh, human rights court because they say Swiss judges should be able to do it even though Switzerland even though Switzerland's membership there had to be approved by a referendum and so there, there, there's a real anything running from skepticism to outright contempt for the court here in a country like this what is the what do you find to be the attitude in Turkey is the tendency simply to brush it all aside and are, do you have any numbers on the cases that have actually been decided in favor of the plaintiffs and then actually enforced. Okay, I have to be honest, I don't have this statistic. I have the number of cases uh, dismissed by the court, which, is, which are 25,000. So out of the 90,000 cases sent in 2017, 25,000 have been dismissed, the other are, are, are pending. So I, I don't have the, the statistic. It's very difficult also to assess because as you know, numbers are published a year after. So in the case of Turkey, uh, we're still in the midst and are at, at the, uh, um, we're still seeing the consequences of uh, the current outbreak on the, the legal profession and the judiciary and also uh, victims generally. So I cannot really answer. I can say that uh, f in terms of, uh, for example, the, uh, the, the, the most recent cases and the one that led to a decision by the court, which is the journalist case, the Al uh, Alpan and Alte uh, case, uh, the constitutional court uh, applied and uh, respected the uh, European Court of Human Rights decision. So you can see that it has it has an impact and it's been re respected. The problem is at the lower level. And this is something that we, we, we have discussed uh, earlier and also in this panel, is 4,000 judges have been dismissed. Those 4,000 judges have been replaced by less experienced judges and uh, um, most of them in line with the government. So they're following the government lines. So the, the decision of the lower courts uh, in this specific case really demonstrates the lack of in independence and impartiality of lower courts at the moment in Turkey. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Under, if I could just come to you, please. Could you tell us about the Arrested Lawyers Initiative and <coughs> your motto, Defending the Defended? Yeah. Actually, um, Arrested Lawyers uh, Initiative, uh, as you know, uh, who is <laughs> uh, dismissed the, their job and uh, they uh, had to and forced to flee to, from their mother country. Uh, and uh, actually, their voices uh, nowadays weak because uh, they, they don't have uh, any governmental support or any uh, foundation. Um, but uh, we hope that uh, r r at the end of the, this story, uh, law will win. Uh, um, if you let me last sentence uh, because i know th this is the last lunch time but i want to explain one my, of my word uh, as i said contemporary genocide this the, this condition because uh, i uh, dismiss it from my job uh, by decree of law uh, and I declare it as a terrorist in the official uh, Gazette uh, and 
my old passport cancelled. I I I I don't have to. I I don't uh, have to. My opportunity move, uh, and my bank account and property, all of properties sized like a, a, another uh, my colleagues. And uh, I am in, I am prisoned. Uh, for uh, fortunately, uh, ten months. Uh, and condition of the prison uh, for us it was really really difficult because we were thirty two person is sitting uh, or jailed in same jail, but jail was for uh, six person. Uh, cell, uh, sorry, cell was uh, for six person. Uh, another twenty four person was uh, lying or sleeping on the floor, and uh, they are they were giving to Soviet breakfast, uh, sometimes lunch, and uh, we have a. Two toilet, one douche, but there is no door. And uh, all of uh, writing and speaking uh, with our family was uh, recording. And in the court during the trial, uh, judge was asking to us, "Why did you say to this verse to your family? Wh what you are hoping?" Uh, so we couldn't say anything to uh, even our family and we couldn't get to any documentation and uh, they take the some of simple rights from us for example support right uh, or have a book or um, how can i uh, talk to, to or meet to family uh, or actually, <laughs> our lawyer. We couldn't we couldn't meet our lawyer because it was banned. Uh, but if you insist or ask again again, they were sent to us to a special cell. Solitary confinement. Yeah. So therefore, I am saying that this this is the contemporary genocide. Professor Demir, if, if I could just end with you, please. Mm -hmm. How can we bridge the gap between policy, talking at an event like this, um, going through ideas? How can we bridge the gap between that and practice, actually pushing Turkey to stop unjustly incarcerating its citizens? How can we do that? First of all, Western powers, Western countries should understand that they are not dealing with a state man. They are dealing with a trade man. He only understand uh, about money. So if European Union, or uh, like United States did uh, for the uh, priest Branson case, put economic pressure on Turkey, then I'm sure that uh, something might change. Otherwise, going uh, lengthy legal procedure does, uh, will take quite a long time. I am concerned with the people in Turkey who can't get out, who are in prison. So we have to produce some remedies for them, not just leave them to do some judges who are appointed by uh, this government and they are in line with the AKP, the party line, and they are so young, they didn't have proper education or training. I know a judge who was my student, one year judge, he's pres uh, in a uh, cr criminal court now. Normally, you you should be at least ten years uh, on the bench to do that. But now, without knowing any procedure, without knowing any law, you are just getting some list from the intelligent agency telling you that who you should uh, release, who you should who you should put in prison. That's how they act. So first, Europe should re realize this and realize that hundreds of thousands of people are suffering there. So then, okay, uh, Turkish government has a leverage 
on his hands. It's uh, Syrian refugees. But Europe has a moral obligation to the world because Europe is a power leading uh, human rights and also maybe some civilization, saying that, stating that, or declaring that they are unique for it. So they should show some courage. And I, I came here. It takes me, it takes courage for me to come here because I know there is a press, Turkish press. They are going to label me as a terrorist, traitors tomorrow. And my family is in Turkey. They might be in danger. But I want to be voice who cannot speak at the moment. And now my son was arrested. He's not speaking to me. He disowned me. Because he says that I was in jail for you. He does, he's young. He doesn't understand what's happening. And he's afraid that he's going to arrest, get arrested again. So think about this. And this is a humanity crisis, not just a legal crisis. It's a humanity crisis. People are left to starve to death. People are left in prison with babies. So we should take this a human crisis and put pressure on. Turkey is trading with Europe. Maybe 60% of the export and import is with Europe. So if Europe put a stop on this, well, obviously this is with economic uh, profit. They, they must sacrifice maybe then I'm sure lots of things will change. Otherwise, like any other authoritarian or dicta uh, regimes or dictatorship, it will go on and pe many people will suffer. Summed up beautifully there, a humanitarian crisis as well as a legal crisis. Um, I'd like to thank my panel for this particular session, Natasha Brack, Dr. Under and Professor Demir. We're now going to break for lunch, which is just behind here. And if we could ask you to be back here at two o'clock when we will discuss the impact that this clamp town has had on civil society in Turkey. Have a good lunch.